Welcome to the Indie Film NYC podcast, where we help filmmakers merge the art and business of independent filmmaking. And I'm your host, John Fallon. This is episode number three of the podcast, and I wanted to focus some time on the world of independent web series. A couple of months back, I was introduced to Michael Field, a filmmaker from Connecticut. Over the past few years, web series have been a popular way for filmmakers to try and make their mark in an arena that's filled with all types of content. Joining in with this trend, Michael has written, produced, and directed a few web series now, most notably The Puzzle Maker's Son, a show that got him membership with the WGA, and Scenes from the Movies, a series that has about 25 episodes to its credit. Michael's current web series project is called Life Ends at 30. It's a six-part series following the lives of several 30-something young adults struggling to figure out what they actually want to do with their life. If you want to know more about Michael and his work, you can check out his website, michaelfield.com. But first, have a listen to my interview with Michael Field. Um, Okay, my name is Michael Field. Um, Let's see, I've been writing for, I'm 40 years old, I'm about to turn 41, so I've been writing for about 20 years. Um, but first it was just me and my buddies doing a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, right out of high school, just kind of like screwing around. Um, we did a couple shorts. We did a couple, we did, we did one feature called Save the Forest, which, uh, we shot in 2003 and we, it was, I guess you could say it was released 2005. Mm-hmm. I was picked up by, I don't know if you remember Newmark Echelon Entertainment. They, they picked it up. They just basically grab, uh, just a buttload of content and then just throw it out there and stuff like that so you know it was fun to see it oh it's available on netflix it's fun it was fun to see it back then like oh hey i had actually remember i had to do a um i had to break down the entire just the dialogue of the script because they needed to translate it into russian but i never you know i never knew what happened after that so uh so it was stuff like that so we did the we did the um we did that feature 2005 after that we did a couple more shorts and then that's Around 2010, I got into the web series business. Um, I wanted to do something episodic. I wanted to do something that I could control and distribute on my own. Uh, So that's what came up with the Puzzle Maker Sun in 2010. And then uh, from there, that's when I got the Puzzle Maker Sun. That's when I got into the Writers Guild because they were trying to branch out into new media. Um, And I'm still a member. And then we did. I did a a comedy series called Scenes from the Movies. Uh, That was 2013, 2012, 2013. Um, to where I am right now. I mean, all throughout that whole time I've been writing, been writing screenplays, shorts, uh, short stories. I wrote one book uh, uh, called Adam Parker and the Radioactive Scout, which is, I self-published that, so that's, a, that's available, that's out there. Um, I did that in 2014. So, uh, and so right now that leads up to Life Ends at 30. Um, the, the most recent thing that I have written was a script called Kiddo, which was a quarterfinalist in the uh, 2015 uh, Nickel Fellowship. So what that was pretty cool. So yeah. you know, so I've just constantly been writing. So okay. So yeah. uh, where did uh, so the the puzzle maker's son? Uh, tell me a little bit about the genesis of that. Uh, you know what? Uh, what was the idea behind that? And uh, you know what was the filmmaking process like for that? Okay. Uh, well, puzzle maker's son started out as a. Uh, it was a short story. It was a short screenplay. It was about nine pages, and and from there, uh, we I fleshed it out to about it came out to about twenty five to thirty pages. So the the series itself, because at that point I knew I wanted to do something episodic. So the series itself uh, was um, ten episodes, probably about two two and a half minutes to three minutes a piece, depending upon the length of the episode, and then um, so uh, so I don't know if you when you you watch I know you watched. The, the series, uh, the 10 episode series, but right. when we first released it, um, the first three episodes were released um, all at once because they were based upon those first nine pages that I had written earlier. Okay. And we kind of likened that to um, uh, like kind of like when you see a new show and it starts off with a two hour movie and then the series after that on TV. So we kind of wanted to like release all of it, three episodes. And those three episodes don't have any hooks on the end. Um, because it's a mystery, so every episode I wanted to make sure that had a hook to want people to come back the next week to watch the show. Right, uh, right. This is before binge watching was kind of like a big thing. Sure. Um, you know, back then web series you released them one day, you set up the schedule. Like for us, it was every Wednesday uh, for the for I think it went for like eight weeks. Okay. Uh, so you know, we we shot Puzzle Maker Son in the span of six days. We wanted it, we shot it basically like a short film. Um, 
my goal with with that with the show was that I wanted it to be um, as cinematic as possible. I wanted it to look good on screen. I mean, I know that you're on the web, so you know you're obviously in quote unquote competition with other web series, mm -hmm. which is true. But you also have I think you have people that come onto the web to watch episodes and they're expecting that stuff to look like what they see on tv what they see in the movies because they don't understand the process they don't understand i'm talking about people that are just kind of like looking Casual for content business. not people right. in the business so sure. you know i think that they expect they expect something that they would see if they flipped on the tv and watched something late at night mm -hmm. so i knew that i wanted to make it as cinematic as possible um which is i think we did in some regard and that's more like locations and just kind of like the depth of field with what you're shooting you're not just in one room you're not just mm -hmm. you know at, you're using one location for like uh five different setups you know we, we tried to move around the state i'm from i'm from connecticut so we shot around connecticut and we we generally got to a lot of locations um and then yeah so that's that's pretty much what what we wanted to do a puzzle maker son once it came out um, you know, the writer, the writer's good was pretty cool, but getting into there for that. And then just kind of like, I met a lot of people for that show and just what we tried to do. And when you, uh, so, but when you, when you did the puzzle maker son, so that was kind of a break. You weren't just writing, you were doing producing, directing kind of the, it, the whole nine for yards. The, for that series? Yeah. Um, well, I'm in it. You know, yeah. the reason why I'm in it is just because I, to save money. Cause I didn't want to, you know, we, we got a couple actors, but I knew that. I would always be there on set, so if we're gonna have the lead, it might as well just be me. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't fancy myself as an actor, as I'm sure you saw on the stage on the screen. <laughs> but uh, it's not what I want to do the most. Obviously, I wanted to write and create, so um, that's kind of. But but that's why I'm in there. And then. Um, but you produced it as well and directed oh, it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I produced it with um, the, the the gentleman that uh, that shot it, the cinematographer. His name's Adrian Korea. He's done he's been doing a couple things right now. Okay. Um, he. Um, we kind of do a lot of our stuff together. Um, I mean, he, he was part of the producing team, so he put up some money, I put up some money. But it was generally just us. So the uh, the Life Ends at 30, tell me about uh, like why you, what, why you decided to go the crowdfunding route uh, and maybe a little bit about uh, what that's taught you, what, what that experience has taught you. Um, well, with, when we, after we did Puzzle Maker... Mm -hmm. um, you know that, that I knew I couldn't do that again as far as put up that money. Mm -hmm. uh, you just you just don't have that. So when we did scenes, that was the, the reason to do scenes from the movies was primarily just because it was low low money. It was one location. We did a green screen. It was nice and easy. Um, so it, it wasn't that expensive. But mm -hmm. with Life at Thirty, <laughs> excuse me, that you know that was going to need money, mm -hmm. and we wanted to do something that we were paying people to do because. You know, if you want good talent, you got to pay for it. So we didn't want we didn't want to just kind of like settle on some uh, settle on sound or settle on an actor. Sure. We wanted people we wanted, and we want to be able to, you know, get them for the projects. So we want to be able to pay them. So that's why we did the crowdfunding. Um, I'm not a really big. I'm in general before we did it, I wasn't a really a big fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still kind of. I mean, it's really tough to to ask people to give you money when you have no. Uh, course of like you know you can't sit there and tell them this is going to be this is going to blow up because you don't know that and you and you can't ever you can't ever predict that unless you have big time talent in there i mean it's very easy for a show like veronica mars to get crowdfunded because they have they had a they have a um a backlog of episodes and fans and they have talent they have major talent there obviously so you know it's very easy for stuff like that to get crowdfunded but people like me people that are trying to do you know indie stuff it's very difficult. So I, I'm not, I was always very skeptical okay. with crowdfunding. And I mean, it, we did it. We didn't reach our goal. Um, we initially did the crowdfunding campaign for um, the entire series now, or uh, like a, a chunk of it. Who, uh, um, who, where did you crowdfund? What platform? Uh, Indiegogo. Okay. Now, was there any input from Indiegogo? Like, how, how did you feel about the experience? So did they help you at all? Uh, nothing, nothing as far as you know, like any kind of personal help. Um, I think we were just, we just kind of signed up. We did what we needed to do. We, you know, we put in the perks. Uh, we did everything on our own there. Um, but I think we chose Indiegogo just, I think because of the percentage of what you would get if you, you know, if you didn't make your goal, you would still get like 75% or you would still get a certain percentage of that or something like that. So we, I think that's why we use Indiegogo as opposed to Kickstarter. Um, but no, we didn't get any kind of uh, feedback from Indiegogo when we, when we did it. Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't even know if they would have 
I don't even know why they would have, uh, you know, reached out to us unless we kind of, I would think that if we kind of made a dent, if like we were, you know, very popular and stuff like that, I'm sure we would have appeared on the front page and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, we didn't generate enough, enough, uh, cash flow to, to kind of warrant that. I don't think. I think crowdfunding is great if to show, um, other investors, you know, the traditional investors that, you've got fans that you've got a following that you've got people interested in purchasing the product once it's done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that in that regard, I think that works great, but I think if using it to primarily be the only funding that you could use for like, you know, like if I'm going to go shoot a movie and I want $1.5 million, I think it's very, very difficult to get that from crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. But I think it's much easier to say like, if I'm going to go shoot a $500,000 movie and I need 20 grand for, craft services or something like that i think then you want to and you want to fund that portion but but show other investors that you've got people interested in the project i think that in that regard i think it works really well mm. so uh so what happened with uh with uh the result of that you said you didn't make, make your goal no we didn't we didn't make the goal for the series so we kind of we used the money um we had always had the intention of doing the promos um which I think we shot about five. I've written, I believe I've written like eight to ten. So what we shot the five that we wanted to use. Okay. Um, so we did use the money for that, and then we then we used the rest of the money for um, the prequel short, the short that we we I wrote like a five page short that took place in one room, mm-hmm. um, and we and that was gonna like I said be uh, that was gonna lead up to the events of the actual series itself, the 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 scripts that I already written. Um, so. We, we were like, you know, we wanted to, sh- we didn't want to just have promos because we were promoing nothing. Right. We wanted to actually have content. So that's why we came up with doing the short. Um, and, and, and it worked out well. So yeah, we were able to fund that. Well, that's a, that's a really good distinction, I think, for people kind of in the same position. Uh, so uh, you, you created, you basically, you basically call it a prequel, right? The, yeah, you know what's funny is like, I haven't, no, I, I've called different things to different people sure. because I just don't know what to call it. It was right. just like, I was like, it's a short. I go, wait a minute. It's a prequel. No, wait a minute. Prequel. We don't we haven't even seen the rest of the stuff, so it can't be. So it's, you know, it's, I guess I still don't know what to call it. Right, right. <laughs> no, but it, I think uh, that's an important thing because uh, you could have done a lot of smoke and mirrors. Like you said, pro- you, you were promoing nothing because you yeah. had great. <laughs> so I, I think that's a great lesson for people to, uh, you know, you know, basically make something of substance to to help get the ball rolling, right? Yeah, I mean, I I don't I I, I in the in the past watching other web series, mm-hmm. it's always a big red flag when you watch episode one, and like they're like, oh, we're shooting episode two now. It's like I never liked not having all the episodes in the can. Like I didn't want to do Puzzle Maker Son, and like not finish, not have the complete season ready to go. Uh, and, and, and promote because I didn't want to promote like oh the series and then like run out of money and you mm-hmm. can't do the last three episodes it's like it just seems counterproductive to what you're trying to do well and you see that a lot right with uh, web yeah, uh, series that just fall off the face of the earth after a couple constantly of I mean there's nothing I mean the, the great thing about web series is it doesn't have to be ten episodes a season it doesn't have sure. to be eight it could be three it could be four it could be whatever you could just do two and you know just say like you know it's like an episodic short or whatever you wanted to call it. you can call it whatever you want but it's like if you don't have any kind of completion or, or of what you're doing, of your story, or what you're trying to say, then it's just kind of people just lose interest, and it just it just kind of looks bad, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's fair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so where are you at now with uh, with Life After Thirty then? Uh, um, so you've got the you've got the promo or prequel or whatever you want to call it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and you have the entire series is written. Is that correct? Yep, yeah, the series the the series are written. It's uh, six episodes. They're about fifteen pages each. So that's all set and done. I've actually written season one. I have written. I've done a treatment and an outline, kind of treatment slash outline for season two. Well, tell um, me. I'm, I'm sorry. Tell me what what is life after thirty? Oh, it's life after thirty. Give, give us your pitch. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I'm terrible at those. <laughs> um, so basically, Life Ends at 30 starts off with a character named David. His best friend's Kyle. Kyle is already 30. David is turning 30. That's where we find him at in his life. He's turning 30. Um, he's getting he's engaged. Um, he has a job he doesn't like. I'm sure a lot of people can you know relate to that. Mm-hmm. And in the span of the first episode, David finds out that his fiance is cheating on him. 
Uh, he loses his job because he just he does something he shouldn't at work, and um, his life just falls apart. And he basically has a it's almost like a pre midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so you know he just kind of like everything just goes to uh, goes to crap. Uh, and then coupled with his friend Kyle, who is basically, I guess self-sabotaging his life these two kind of stumble through and struggle through trying to figure out um what it's like to be 30 um when they're basically not mature enough uh, emotionally to be 30 uh and so they just they just go through a series of events david david starts hanging out with teenagers skateboarding teenagers you know not not uh kyle kyle think i i being in the industry and dealing with um indie film i have a lot of experience with dealing with um uh people who want to be writers, people who want to be uh, actors, but really don't want to do the work. Um, not saying that anyone personally I know does like that, but you run into those people. Mm -hmm. And um, so with Kyle, that Kyle decides that he's just going to be an actor. So I get to have fun with Kyle trying to be an actor, uh, uh, but not wanting to do the work. So, um, and that's it. So these guys stumble through life, stumble through this, this part of their life, um, you know, make new friends, uh, they befriend they befriend a uh, a bum that's in the uh, <laughs> that lives around the area that call that that teaches David about life lessons. It's a, it's just a straight comedy, and uh, like I said, these guys are just trying to struggle to be thirty years old and try to struggle to be adults when they're not really adults at all. Well, so um, I feel like one of the uh, conversations that, that people are having about uh, you know independent filmmakers is that so you've, you've got this project you want to. Uh, you want to grow your brand, you want to grow your audience, you know, what, what kind of steps have you taken to do that sort of thing? Like, have you thought about who this is going to, how are you going to reach them? Can you, can you speak a little bit about that? About finding our audience? Yeah, about, about finding your audience, yeah. Well, Life in the 30s is obviously, it's a, a comedy, it's, I wouldn't say it's a comedy in the terms of like, um... Uh, like a PG comedy. It's probably a hard R comedy. So, you know, obviously that's going to appeal to a certain type of person. It's going to appeal to a younger crowd. Um, our, our demographic is probably college kids. Um, you know, obviously kids that are about to turn 30. Um, we don't hold any punches with the comedy itself. Uh, so, I mean, I, I already know that it's not going to appeal to someone like my mother or my father just because, you know, that's not something they would be. And that's fine. And that's just not the type of comedy it is. So, I mean, we knew that that's who we are that's, that's who would appreciate the comedy the most. Mm -hmm. And then we go about, we, we did the Facebook page, we, do the, we have the Twitter handle. Um, you know, we reach out, uh, obviously, through all types of social media. We have the Instagram. So in that regard, it's, it's grassroots right now, and, in that, and it's, it's, it's kind of like just kind of putting it out there, putting the name out there, because we just started doing this, um, I want to say, towards the end of last year. That's when we kind of made the decision to do to, to do the series. Okay. So we're probably about six, seven months into actually putting ourselves out there. So it's kind of just starting. And who is, um, who's we? Is oh, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, um, so the... Um, the team is the producer. Uh, her name is Trish Clark. She um, she's out of New Haven. She runs the Forty Eight Hour Film Festival in New Haven. Uh, she's part of the ITV Fest. Uh, so she she produced the Trans Candidate, which I know you saw the short that I did in early two thousand fifteen. Mm -hmm. She produced that. Um, she's producing that with uh, uh, another guy, uh, Pat Patrick Whalen, who's actually helping us out well, a lot of with the social media stuff. He's involved with the ITV as well. Uh, and then uh, we're working with a local cinematographer in the area, David Brown. Um, so the four of us are, are kind of like the team behind uh, the show. Um, and they all, we all met, um, I actually did a, uh, I wrote and directed a commercial for the New Haven 48 hour film festival, which is where we all met. I knew Pat, uh, Whalen from, uh, my puzzle maker Sundays. Cause he, I, he was, um, he worked at the local university. He was going to the local university and we used him and a bunch of his buddies, uh, on the set, like as interns for puzzle maker son, which was big time help because, yeah. you know, we, not, we obviously didn't pay that, but we, they got credit and whatnot. I think they got credit. I, I remember signing some stuff. So, um, so he's kind of come along. So that's kind of, we would do trans candidate. And then we just kind of like, we had a series of stuff. We had a bunch of, um, stuff that I had written that we chose from. To mm -hmm. figure out like okay, what what should we do next, and that's where Life Into Thirty came from. And uh, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about you know how how important is it to have that team because I feel like a lot of people, you know, uh, myself included, can be out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, making you know making these plans and making this uh, art by by myself. But 
you know, uh, you know, it, it seems daunting to reach out. So, I mean, oh yeah, I mean, all the other stuff I've done to, all the other stuff I've done up until um, Trans Candidate, which technically Trans Candidate was something that I wanted to do, and that's kind of where Trish came on. So, I've everything before that was always just me kind of getting the food, getting, you know, getting the location fees, doing this, everything. I mean, not to say that I did not have help. I absolutely did have help in the other stuff, but it was just, you know, I was directing, I wrote it, I was directing, I was producing. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to have all those hats on because even though you can do it, you know, stuff may slack, you know, because you just can't focus on a lot of things. So yeah. with Life Ends at 30, Trish, um, at, with the promos and with the short, Trish was really big help just because, she's doing a lot of the producing and, and I, you know, I feel bad because I'm just like, you know, you sure don't want me to do something. And she's like, I have it. So it's nice. It's really nice that I can focus directing. And, and, and in that regard, that's fantastic. But I, I mean, I have been on the other side of just kind of like doing everything and it, it, it's, I can understand why people, you know, drop out and, 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 you know, don't do a lot of more indie productions because it's really difficult. And do you feel the quality suffers when you're doing everything by yourself? I think so. I think you might, I mean, it, it might not be the fact that it's like really terrible, but like you are probably missing on just being that much more, you know, better in what in your shot, shot selection or even just talking to your actors. I mean, it's like when you're directing a, a short or you're directing a, an episode and you want to focus on something with your actor, but you have to worry about making sure we get the food ready or making sure that, you know, you know, we, we've, why is the cop looking at us? You know, like that kind of thing. Like when you have to worry about that, it just, you're not able to focus on what you need to focus on it. And you may not notice it, but it, you know, it, it, it shows up later on in the edit when you're like, Oh, what the heck is that? You know, like, so you can't fix it after that point. Do you have any tips for young filmmakers that are trying to make those connections? How, like, who should they reach out to? And who, like, in, uh, experience? Yeah. in my experience, I mean, I would, <sighs> you can't, uh, it, that's tough because it, I've, I've, it's not that I haven't worked with, I've worked with a lot of great people, um, people that I'm always appreciative of them giving their time because, you know, they don't have to be doing anything that I'm asking them to do. They, they could just be like, see you later. I'm like, we don't want to help you because, you know, obviously not paying a lot of people. Um, but I think people that like genuinely, you know, are hardworking, that want to have a great attitude, you know, that aren't on the set complaining. Like I, you know, I worked on one production where um, I paid, I had to pay one person because he was doing something that was so specific I had to pay him and he's on the set complaining and it's like I'm, you're the only one getting paid and you're complaining and you don't need that and then I think after that we're just like we're not working with this person again because I don't you know so I think people that are just kind of like have a great attitude that want to work that want to do the hard work and help and just be a part of that process um, I think once you find those type of people once you find like you, you should always those should always be your first call you know once, once you find that type of person well so Connecticut's kind of a small you know it's you know, where where I'm over here in New York City, so I can, uh, you know, pretty much go outside my door, throw a rock, and uh, find, <laughs> find find a filmmaker, right? So yeah. how, where 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 are the filmmakers hiding in in small town America? I guess you know? <laughs> they're probably working in New York City. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're not that we're not that far away. We're um, I'm where I live. I'm only about an hour hour and fifteen minutes by drive, depending what, on traffic. What are there groups oh. that that you go to? Like do you, not, I mean, there's a there's a there's a couple um, production houses in the area, um, but they generally do uh, like you know maybe commercial work and stuff like that, or just kind of like infomercials and stuff. Um, a lot of the people that I work with, uh, um, even though they're based in Connecticut, they work out of New York. Okay. So I mean, so I mean, there's there's productions that pop up every you know all over the place, but there's nothing specific that um, I I actually you know get a lot of my people from i mean now with with life into 30 i rely on trish and dave to find crew members mm -hmm. i know that dave is part of the dcc which is the i'm gonna butcher the name director can i don't know it's it's a dcc club it's basically local filmmakers in the area they get together every uh, every month and, and meet up um that's but i just i don't know the name that's something people can find <laughs> online yeah, um, you know, I can I can try to find it. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it, a yeah. link in the show notes. Sure, right. sure. Um, and so, uh, the the actor. Tell me a little bit about the the. You have, it's one main actor, right, for the for the series. Uh, uh the promo with the the one that we put out. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's 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 Rob um, Rob King. He's playing uh, he's playing David. 
Um, his best friend, uh, Kyle, is being played by Evan Kaufman. It's, you know, what's funny is um, when I first wrote the scripts, um, it was about them. And I think that it's probably going to turn into more of an ensemble piece, uh, you know, with their, with, you know, their significant others and, and uh, their friends that they meet along the way. So we've casted, um, uh, we've casted, the, there's probably, I would say there's three main roles. There's Rob King, who plays David, Evan Kaufman, who plays Kyle, and Lorraine Sink, who plays Susan. Oh, she's, Susan is Kyle's uh, wife. Um, so there's probably those three that are kind of the mains and then everyone else is uh, filtered in after that, uh, which we've casted some, we haven't casted all of them yet. And you found those through Trish? Uh, I found, I, we actually did, I, we worked with Lorraine, you probably, uh, she was the, uh, the female staffer in the trans candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, I found, I actually found her through, uh, the actor that was in the trans candidate, James Coker, who he knew her. So he, we kind of asked him, we were looking for people. We had somebody, they, she dropped out, um, just scheduling conflict. Uh, so we asked him if he knew anybody offhand. So we kind of, we, that's how we got her. Rob, I actually knew from an older web series that I uh, had written, um, that he was in and I kind of kept contact with. And, and when we, when I wrote Dave and we were looking for people, I had seen Rob's other stuff and I, I kind of had an idea that he, he probably would have been good at this role, which he, he is, he's really good. So, um, that's where we found him. And then, uh, I think the same the same way we found Evan and everyone else, we've just basically asked our actors for suggestions. I mean, with the show itself, with Life Ends at 30, because it's a comedy, because it's an ensemble piece, I think that the actors need to be familiar with each other, need to work well together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cause, because there's a lot of a lot of the comedy not not stem, not only stems from the script, but also stems from, you know, their kind of like they're playing with the words, they're ad-libbing and stuff like that. So I wanted people that kind of were familiar with each other, um, not necessarily at to the detriment of the, of, the, of the show itself, but just people that would, you know, fit. Mm -hmm. So we kind of used our actors to, uh, to help find us the other actors. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of where we got them all. Yeah, that's interesting. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who, you know, they've, they've got an idea for a web series, like... Uh, you know, they've got the script in hand. They're, they're, <laughs> they think they're ready to go. Uh, you know, what's the first thing to attack before they start uh, trying to go out and shoot something? Um, I mean, I think I think you need to. It's tough to say to tell somebody to find money, but mm -hmm. I think you need to focus on. Um, the first thing you need to do is make sure your script is really good. Make sure focus on your script. Um, I mean. I, the script is kind of like the foundation. So, I mean, the house built on a crappy foundation falls. So you got to make sure your script is really good for what you're trying to do. I'm not saying, like, if your script's a comedy, it's got to be really funny. It just has to be solid. You're telling the story. You're getting your message across. Once you get that, I think the two things that you need to focus on is getting good talent um, and getting good audio, getting good sound, getting a good sound guy because there's nothing that pulls people out of, of, a, of a bad web series and really bad audio, um, you know. And, and, and bad acting. And by bad acting, I don't mean bad actors. I mean actors that maybe don't fit that role. Like if you have a friend that is like um, really funny and, you love, and you've worked on all this stuff, but your web series is a drama and he's not really great at drama, don't put him in there because he's your friend because you're going to make him look bad and you're going to make yourself look bad. So find people that fit the roles you need. I mean I've worked with people who, you know, I'll, I'll, that I've been in stuff and I'm – doing something new and like, Hey, you know, would you got anything for me? And I'm like, no, I don't because you don't fit in this. You know, mm -hmm. you're not, it's not, you don't play that character. And that's not saying you're a bad actor. It's just saying that you just don't fit. And if right. I put you in there, you're going to look bad and you know, and I'm going to look bad. So, you know, you need to find good actors that will fit your roles and you need to have, you need to make sure you have a good sound guy and a good post sound guy. Again, same, you know, you want to make sure, cause he may sound great on set, but you want to make sure that it's mixed great uh, in the post. So that wraps up my interview with Michael Field. I got a chance to catch up with Michael the other day, and he told me some good news. The first episode of his web series, Life Ends at 30, will be debuting at the ITV Fest this October. So make sure you check out the show notes for festival information and screening times on the IFTV Fest website. In fact, if you're a producer of a TV pilot, a web series, or a short film, I can't recommend the ITV Fest highly enough. I have personal experience with that festival because a couple of years back I directed a web series called Common Charges that debuted there and I had a great time. The festival is held just a few hours north of New York City in Dover, Vermont. 
Dover is a quiet little town, and when the festival is going on, it feels as if the entire town is participating, and everything is geared toward you as the filmmaker. And because everything is focused on the festival, unlike festivals in big cities, it's really easy to network with the other industry pros. One last thing that I want to say about web series is that it seems really difficult to cut through the noise and make a successful web series that gets the filmmakers any type of industry attention. Both Michael and I are torn about whether or not emerging filmmakers should even put the energy into a web series, or if they'd be better off putting into a short film or a feature. From the discussion we had, we decided to explore the kind of pros and cons of web series. We will most likely explore the idea through a series of blog posts. I'm also going to put some time into researching what web series were successful and why, and bring that information to you so you can decide for yourself if you want to go down the path of a web series. But if you do, I hope that the information we provide will help you make informed decisions about your project and put you in the best position for success. So keep an eye out for that series. Along with the information for that, I'll also be putting many other things into our monthly newsletter. So to really stay informed about what we're doing here at IndieFilmNYC.com, please sign up for our newsletter. The Indie Film NYC podcast is available on both iTunes and Stitcher. So if this podcast is interesting or useful to you, then please subscribe. And if you can give us a rating and a review, that would be even better because it will help more people find us and spread the word. And of course, please check out the other blog posts and filmmaking information that's available on our growing website, IndieFilmNYC.com. And thanks for listening.